sometimes sloths in trees grab their own arms thinking that they're tree branches and then they often fall to their deaths this is a situation in which one is not sure whether to laugh or to cry and that's rather how I'm feeling this week despite not having met with any sloths on the one hand uh, we've had the results from an election in which large swathes of the English electorate indicated their support for uh, an anti-immigration, anti-European, isolationist policies of the far-right party UKIP. And on the other hand, we're presented with this narrative from ACTS about breaking down barriers, welcoming outsiders, and living with unity within diversity. I don't know whether to laugh with the mocking tone of the scriptures uh, or to cry that we seem so far away from their ideal. We just get the very end of the story today. Really, it starts right at the, at the beginning of chapter 10. Um, Cornelius, he's a Roman soldier. He's a, a ranking officer, uh, a Gentile, but a man who's accustomed and, and used to Jewish piety uh, and seems to be practicing some form of belief. He's praying in the afternoon and a vision comes to him to send for this man, Simon Peter, and he's told where to find him. And so off he sends some messengers. And then the scene flashes over to Simon. And he's heading up to his roof, Simon Peter, and he falls asleep and has a doze in that famous uh, vision he has of the blanket coming down with all of the unclean foods on them and him being told to eat. And it happens three times and the voice from heaven says to him, don't declare unclean what I've told you is clean or don't declare profane what I tell you is holy. Before he has a chance to uh, engage in any of these new delicacies, the messengers from Cornelius turn up and they tell him that their master wants him to come and see, see him. And Peter is taken aback and not really at all sure whether he ought to go because it involves overnight stays, fellowship, eating at the tables of Gentiles, something which from his youth he's been taught is not an appropriate thing for him as uh, a religious Jew to be engaged with. But again, he hears from God and God says, go without hesitation. And there's a fun bit of wordplay here. Uh, the word that we translate hesitation, which does mean that, um, also means uh, distinction in the sense of the thing required to discern between two different things. So he says, go without hesitation. But he also says, go without distinction, go without discerning between any two things. And so Peter goes to Cornelius taking with him some of the other Jewish believers. And then he preaches to Cornelius and his household and his community. And that's where we pick up the story today. Our first verse, while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. If you've ever had that guilty feeling of, uh, oh my goodness, is the preacher not finished yet? Is this going to go on for another five minutes? Then, I suggest that rather than resigning yourself to that boredom, you instead pray for the breakthrough of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and if you do that uh, when I'm preaching, uh, and if your prayers are answered, uh, and if the Holy Spirit comes and breaks me off halfway through a sentence, then uh, no matter how much preparation I put in, I promise I, I shan't be cross with you. And it is important to note the role that the Holy Spirit does play within that meeting. We can often, I think, be anxious about the role that we're asked to take within spreading the word, within evangelism. Last year when we were doing uh, that year of mission, one of Bishop Stephen's favourite catchphrases, and I've, I've heard him say it, say it this year as well, is that the Holy Spirit is the evangelist. We can feel like we're being called to do something that, that we can't possibly do. And in a way, that's true. Um, 
We're not in the business of, of converting. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. What we are called to do is to be a people that welcomes, a people that allows others to belong, not because they conform to what they uh, to, to what we to what we desire of them, but because uh, they find in us a welcome despite their difference. We're called to be a people of uh, fellowship and generosity. We're called to share the good news that has impacted our life, just in the same way that we share the latest interest that we have in, in, in the best good book we just read or the best film we just watched. Now, for some of us, even that idea is unsettling enough. And if you struggle to welcome others, or if you struggle to share your faith, then I suggest that uh, a safer first step, perhaps, is to pray for the guidance, the courage and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And to keep doing that day by day and month by month until you feel content and strong in being able to share and welcome. Peter did share his faith and it had um, a rather explosive effect. In verse 47, we read his rhetorical question, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people? Um, and for those of you who were here last week listening to the lectionary readings, that will spark in your mind the words of the Ethiopian eunuch. Look, says the eunuch, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? Both the eunuch and the people listening to Peter's preaching, they're ready to be baptized almost immediately. They've heard the good news, it's taken root, they're ready and they're raring to go. I watched a, a video some, some time ago now, and I was trying to find it again um, this past week and I couldn't, which was really annoying me. It's um, half an hour's footage sped up into, into one minute. And it's a still shot camera facing a, a sofa from the perspective of a the television, I suppose. And you see a man on the sofa, uh, and over the course of this 30 minutes, sped up to one minute, he changes position a, a couple of times. He kind of leans his uh, head on his arm like this, or he sort of scratches his head. Meanwhile, there's his two or two and a half year old who zips around the room at lightning speed, you know, chasing after the cat and jumping up on the sofa and grabbing at his dad's legs and going kind of up to the television this close and then running back away. And I thought that was a really um, good image <coughs> of what it can be like for um, those inside the church, those like Peter's followers that he brought with him when he came to preach, and those coming to faith for the first time. It takes time for those inside to catch up. We read, the circumcised believers who'd come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. They knew that um, this God that they were uh, worshipping was amazing. They knew that he could come back from the dead, okay. But to even reach out to the Gentiles, what were these new heights of, of majesty? The Spirit, of course, came to them uh, at, at Pentecost, recorded you know, eight or nine chapters earlier. And at the time, Peter quotes from the prophet Joel, saying, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. But obviously it's taken a bit of time for him and for his followers to really get to the heart of what that prophecy means. And when Peter in the next chapter gets back to Jerusalem, he really gets torn into by the community there who say, we've been hearing, you've been fraternizing with these Gentiles, these outsiders, and we're not at all sure that you should be taking the word of God to them. And he has to robustly defend himself. The borders which we socially construct, whether they be around uh, ethnicity as they are in this story, Jews and Gentiles, those who are in and those who are out, or whether they be around gender or sexuality or class, they make us feel safe because 
They break up the world into little chunks that we can comprehend. They let us say, I'm one of these, and she's one of these, but he's one of those. And we often think that to engage with the other is frightening because they're not like us, because we don't know who they are. But I kind of wonder whether really the reason that it's frightening to engage with the other is that it destabilizes who we think we are. Every time we engage in putting people into those boxes like that, we engage in putting ourselves into one, being comfortable in knowing who they are and being comfortable in knowing who we are. Engaging with the other destabilizes our knowledge of ourselves. I think we need to pick up the courage as individuals to live beyond those kind of unsupported stereotypes that keep us comfy. We need to pluck up the courage as the church to welcome others, to dream beyond the bounds of the parish or the team or the denomination. To reject the instruments that divide, to fling wide open our gates, to flatten the barriers that we've erected. When we're frightened and anxious and concerned for our well-being, it's easy to lock and bolt the door, to demonize the other and to stick to our own, to act with suspicion and distrust. For these reasons, now more than ever, we as the Christian witnesses here in Epping must show that we know another way to live. The good news of the Christian faith is that by the grace of God, we've all received in full his love for us. God holds nothing back from us at all. At our cry of repentance, he cleanses all of our sin. And through his son, Jesus Christ, he comes into an all-encompassing communion with us. Just like those who were listening to Peter's sermon, who were filled by the Holy Spirit, we've been given a complete portion. Live as people of God, redeemed by Christ, fearless in the power of the Holy Spirit, and united in the love of the Father. Amen.